Thank you very much, BJ, and good evening, everybody. Looking at all the empty chairs at the end of your first day, I remember a similar situation back in my university debating days where uh, we had to always begin our speeches with Mr. Chairman and members of the House. But seeing the handful of, uh, of people grimly staying on for the end of the day, I said, Mr. Chairman and embers of the House, which is what it looks like we have here today. But good that those of you who have survived to stay on will have a chance to uh, discuss innovation in India together. I'm glad to be back at the Thai conference. I actually spoke here in 2006 when I keynoted the then Thai conference, which I think was your second or third ever Thai conference uh, on the subject, uh, remember, of disruption and convergence. And in many ways, talking about innovation seems the right step forward from there. Because as somebody who's engaged in policy making in India, and who's captivated by the subject of innovation. Um, to my mind, it is so indispensable for us to figure out how we can drive change in a country like India in the 21st century. And um, in a country where very clearly, thank you so much, very clearly the need for um, transforming a country whose uh, social trajectory has not always been in the right direction. 1.3 billion people in need of a significant transformation. And that's where innovation clearly comes in to our society. Um, both innovation and entrepreneurship are finally acknowledged as indispensable in our path to the future. And, um, and the, the importance of finding fresh thinking to deal with the new challenges facing India's development has never been more apparent. Uh, the evolving technological challenges you're also familiar with, but which are still relatively new to us in India, the era of big data sets, blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, a burdening demand for new products and services within the domestic market, and of course, issues of both the availability of domestic and international funding have all been key to figuring out how best we can deal with innovation. Startups are now permeating our landscape. Um, Indians have begun disrupting mainstream ways of thinking and embraced innovation more and more. And so the challenge has always been to find new answers to the perennial old questions that we in Indian policy making have always to, to grapple with. It's interesting when we speak of innovation today, it seems almost self-evidently a good thing. And yet, uh, if you um, are int as interested in language and meaning and nuance as I am, innovation was a negative word till the early 20th century. It was considered a bad thing, innovation. Uh, it was really Joseph Schumpeter, the famous economist, who first gave it a positive spin by saying that innovation uh, was in fact the precursor to development and entrepreneurship was the pathway between the two. And of course, we're seeing that actually happening uh, in, 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 in our country. Now, in India, we actually have a hoary tradition of innovation. We are the land, of course, that invented the zero, making the decimal system possible, even if today it seems that all we invent is zero. It wasn't always that way. Um, our prime minister attracted a lot of uh, laughter when he said that the appearance of the Lord Ganesha suggested the existence of plastic surgery in ancient India. Uh, but though his example was manifestly wrong because the smallest imaginable elephant head couldn't possibly be grafted onto the largest imaginable human neck, he was actually right, and unfortunately that message was lost, that India was the world's first successful um, practitioners of, of plastic surgery because there is documented evidence 2,000 years ago of a successful rhinoplasty operation the procedure and the instruments have been found. And Shushruta is really the original founder of, of modern surgery um, because, as I say, both his methods and his instruments have stood up to the test of time. So innovation, one could argue, is indeed in the Indian tradition. And, um, and yet when we speak of innovation today in India, we really relate it to all of you 
It's the, um, the uh, remarkable and proven record of Indians in globally recognized innovation hubs such as Silicon Valley and particularly Silicon Valley, which has seen, um, I think, innovators in India being inspired. I read a, an interesting statistic recently. There are so many different numbers floating around. This might be a, a, a wrong as well, but it said 13.4% of all the startups that originated in the valley between the early 80s and the early 2000s were founded by Indians, uh, many of which, of course, have gone on to become household names across the world, and that 40% of all Silicon Valley companies today have Indians amongst their founders or in their leadership. Now, together with our historic aptitude for adaptability and entrepreneurial strengths, um, I would say that, that we are, in that sense, uh, inspired in the right way by the right sets of Indians. Today, uh, Bangalore has become sort of the Silicon Plateau to your Silicon Valley. Uh, there's uh, a place near Mumbai that's jokingly called Pawai Valley because of the number of startups located there. And um, from Oyo to Ola, Indian startups have really begun to make um, a significant difference, not just in India, but increasingly across the global landscape. Some have joined the list of global unicorns. Um, those, uh, those startups valued at over a billion dollars. Um, and of course, the very term unicorn, when Eileen Lee coined it, implied uh, what a mythical achievement that was, how rare and how impossible it was. But in fact, the number of unicorns has, of course, proliferated. And, um, and in India, they've even invented a little club for small businesses and young and ambitious ventures called the nano unicorns. Um, so there's, there's all of this happening. There's a nano unicorn pilot project, um, pilot project in the Indian state of Odisha, which promotes skill development and business capacities for individuals who display entrepreneurial traits. Uh, but they, of course, um, include everything from a small scale manufacturing unit to a roadside street food vendor, because every one of those are potentially major success stories. We have a 50% increase in the startups associated with advanced technology. Um, and we're making important strides in the Internet of Things and in data analytics, setting the place uh, globally in the latter uh, with, in tandem with the amplification of entrepreneurial diversity in India. Um, right now, the government estimates that we are already the world's third largest startup ecosystem. We have um, an estimated uh, over 10,000 startups in the country now, and um, that comes from about 4,700 in 2016, which suggests you know, if you can double the number of startups, viable startups in four years, you must be doing some things right. And I, I think back, as many of the people here are of my vintage and grew up and studied in India, how few were the possibilities available to us as we were leaving university in the late 60s or early 70s, and how limitless seem to be the options today. I mean, the IITs were already then seen as the uh, lodestar of, of uh, educational excellence in technology. Today, IIT Kharagpur already, already has established a center for artificial intelligence, and they're launching certificate programs uh, in artificial intelligence and machine learning from this year, starting in March. Um, you know, 50, 60 years ago, Jawaharlal Nehru called the IITs India's future in the making. And now we're seeing young professionals genuinely making India's future, even in a cutting edge discipline like artificial intelligence. Now, innovation really, in the modern sense, has become possible in India just in the last generation because um, the transformation of the economy uh, with the liberalization of 1991 when Dr. Manmohan Singh, then finance minister, told parliament in a famous speech, paraphrasing Victor Hugo, that no power on earth could stop an idea whose time had come. And that idea was to liberalize the Indian economy, which gave us growth and diversity, helped us to weather the storms that shook the global economy and all of you uh, from the, the recession period of 2008 onwards. Uh, and has enabled us, at least in purchasing power parity terms, PPP, to overtake Japan to become the third largest economy in the world. And these core strengths 
have made India the world's fastest growing major economy and arguably uh, with the amount of innovation and entrepreneurship that has been unleashed, the best is yet to come. We have obviously the demographic advantage we Indians like to point to. We have a younger population than any of our Asian rivals, China, Japan, South Korea. Everyone's aging, the Europeans are aging. The average age uh, next year to 2020 is going to be 46 in Europe, is going to be almost 40 in China, is 39 in the US, and um, in Japan it's going to be 47, whereas in India it's still going to be 29. Uh, we have 50% uh, of our population under 25, 65% of our population under 35. And um, potentially that means we could be the engine of the world, uh, in a sense, doing what China did for the previous generation, um, if, of course, we can get things right. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, has said that by 2020, we will have in India 116 million workers in the job starting age group of 20 to 24, whereas China will only have 94 million. These uh, should mean that we have the, the workforce that can really change the world, but that will depend very much on whether we are able to skill them, educate them, train them, and equip them to take advantage of the opportunities and the challenges of the first quarter of the 21st century. Now, these are all, all the, the challenges we're facing, and, and they really are challenges because we also know, we already know, that if we don't rise uh, to this demographic opportunity, we could be facing a demographic disaster. Because um, this, the tragic reality is that if we produce legions of uneducated or, or, or undereducated, unemployed and arguably unemployable young men, then we find, as we've seen now in 106 districts in our country already, that they become fodder for dangerous ideologues. All these Maoist insurrections that have affected these 106 districts are insurrections in which these people, these young men, without any stake in our society because they don't feel equipped to participate in our economy, where they are vulnerable to the blandishments of somebody with a thousand rupees, $15, and a Kalashnikov. And that ultimately is the kind of risk that we have to face. A different risk we're facing, of course, is the risk that all of you are unleashing with the revolution in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in automation. Uh, last year, or rather two years ago, there was an Oxford Martin School study which said a number of absolutely stunning things. Uh, the hopeful thing for many of the young people in this part of the world is that 30% of the jobs that will exist by 2030 are jobs that don't exist today. So there's always a hope that new opportunities are coming, come, coming down the pike for all of you. But in India, what do we see? The same study says 85% of jobs in developing countries are at the risk of automation. 77% of all the jobs in China will disappear with automation. But 69% of all the jobs in India, they say, will disappear. Uh, our IT sector, the great success story of the 90s and the first decade of the century, India's IT sector is deeply vulnerable, according to the Oxford Martin School, because 6.4 lakh, that's 640,000 low-skilled IT positions will be extinguished by 2021. That's two years away. And, uh, and I um, have often told my uh, constituents, uh, we have a techno park in Tiruvananthapuram, which was the first techno park in India, still remains an exciting hub for innovation and technology. I'm proud of the fact that I was able to inveil Oracle into establishing uh, a decent sized operation there, and others are falling suit. Right now, the global IT headquarters of Nissan has relocated to the Technopark in my constituency of Thiruvananthapuram. But I also tell them, and I, I, I warn them, that um, this is a dizzyingly rapidly moving uh, innovation environment. And that um, in the late 1990s uh, came the dawn of, a, of a, a very sobering success story that became a failure story. I don't know how many of you, this is your world, you probably know it better than I do, uh, but in the 1990s, how many of you bet on the future of this new business that India was cornering the market on called medical transcription? You know how that worked? An American doctor would see his patients all day, 
dictate his notes into a machine at night. They'd be zinged over when he went to bed to some adequately educated Indian who would wake up in the morning in India while the American doctor was sleeping, had the medical vocabulary to type up the notes accurately. He would go to bed and zing them back to America, and the American doctor would wake up in the morning and all his notes from the previous day were perfectly ready and available for use, typed up and on his computer. Well, this seemed to be a wonderful thing. American doctors turned more and more to Indian medical transcription companies. It was a booming business. New companies were being established by the month. India cornered 96% of the world's medical transcription business at its peak. And then what happened? Boom was followed by bust. Today, these medical transcription companies are folding faster than a deck of cards. There are barely one or two left, and they're already facing extinction. And why is that? Because, of course, voice recognition technology in the Western world got so sophisticated that the American doctor no longer needs to zing his notes over to India and have to um, read what an Indian has made out of them. He just speaks into his own computer and he can see his notes appear magically before him with a greater degree of accuracy and for one-time expenditure on software rather than having a recurrent contract with an Indian medical transcription business. And that was the end of what just 15 years ago seemed to be an absolutely rising, innovative, uh, offshore business that India could thrive on. So those are the kinds of challenges that we have to, we have to face. And, and so in harnessing our nation's potential, uh, we have to really show leadership across all sectors of our economy. Look at the, um, the demographic potential I talked about, develop the strength of brand India that we've been pretty good at marketing, but create and cultivate an ecosystem of innovation that can make all of this work. Um, and I, I, it's not, not easy, uh, given many of the realities of India that I know a lot of you are familiar with, and given, of course, where we started, because uh, I never tire of reminding India's critics that, uh, that the British left us with a track record of 0.01% growth in the last 50 years of the British Empire, an abysmal 17% literacy, and 90% of our population below the poverty line. They'd come to a country that accounted for 27% of global GDP in 1700 and reduced it to a poster child for third world poverty by the time they left. And given where we started in 1947, we've come a longer way that most people do give us credit for. Today, it's striking, for example, that some of the innovative Indian practices from the Dabbawalas of Mumbai to the toilets of the Sulab International or the Kulhar Chai of the Indian railways are all being studied in places like Harvard Business School. And this suggests that you can come up in situations of great scarcity and deprivation with innovative practices and financial management techniques that the rest of the world believes it can learn from. For the longest time, the biggest buzzword, of course, was Jugaad. I remember just eight years ago, I was invited to inaugurate the India Innovation Center at the University of Toronto. And um, I, was, I was very impressed with um, the fact that a, a Canadian university uh, was actually creating an India Innovation Center before any Indian university had thought to do so. But, um, but when I did that, I must say I devoted a large chunk of my inaugural speech to Jugaad, right? That was the buzzword at the time. And sure enough, I had a fairly short shelf life because Jugaad, that is making do with what you've got to find improvised solutions to your problems, uh, was soon enough derided by critics as, um, as, as a method of just twisting your way around the system to get things done, of cutting corners and so on. But I would uh, argue that um, in talking about Jugaad, people like me were not implying that you should just make do rather than strive for excellence. We were saying, and I was certainly saying, that what Jugaad allowed you to do was find new ways of thinking out of the box, to repurpose things, to make do with what you've got within your resource constraints, because we have resource constraints you can't, you can't wish away, that you need to create solutions uh, in, in a creative way and in a non-traditional way to real-world problems. Uh, so standing here in Santa Clara, it may seem absurd, but there is the Indian villager who constructs a makeshift 
vehicle to transport his livestock and goods by rigging a wooden ox cart with an irrigation hand pump that serves as an engine. Why not, right? I mean, the irrigation hand pump was meant actually to pump water. The ox cart was meant to be drawn by an ox. But you put one on top of the other and you get yourself a vehicle you can transport the oxen on. And people have done so. There are pictures of it on Google. Common household objects can be reincarnated in purposes their manufacturers never intended. You'll see a very interesting site in some of the Lassi Dhabas of Punjab in the coming summer, when on the hot days, people drink inexhaustible supplies of buttermilk, either salt or sweet or occasionally with mango, right? The, the Lassi is the favored drink for a hot day in an Indian summer, particularly in the Punjab. Well, increasingly, the volume of demand is so great that we have seen in some Lassi shops the Lassi being made not in a large mixer, but in a washing machine. And the inventor of the washing machine had never imagined that such a purpose could be found for his product. But that's Jugard as well. And you can actually produce an awful lot more Lassi in a washing machine than you can in a mixer. And that gives you economies of scale and time. Everything can be reimagined and repurposed. Um, after all, we're the country that invented when mobile telephony came along but was too expensive for most Indians, we invented the solution. It was called the missed call, right? So if you were in university and uh, you couldn't afford the phone bill for calling home, you gave your folks a missed call, one ring and you hung up and they knew they're supposed to call you back on their bill. And that again is, is, is the Indian innovation that, uh, that we specialize in. Um, instead of complicating or refining existing products, we tend to strip them down to their bare essentials. And Indian innovation, therefore, is often more affordable, more accessible, more durable, and more effective. If you Google the words frugal innovation, your first 20 hits will all relate to Indian innovations. And that's because we are still a poor country, or as some would have it, a rich country full of poor people. But the fact is those poor people mean that we are trying to achieve success within real financial constraints, and that, um, and that uh, the bottom of the the pyramid really does matter to us. I mean, uh, I used to know C.K. Prahalad who came up with that very interesting idea of the bottom of the pyramid, but he was actually describing a reality. It was an Indian company that said, look, if a poor villager can't afford in those days prices a 60 rupee bottle of shampoo, why not sell him or her a five rupee sachet that'll last for one or two washes and they'll buy that, and they did. And that kind of marketing approach has also made innovation very successful. Sometimes the innovation is successful and the marketing is not. The poster child for that is probably the Tata Nano, which really was a world-beating innovation, right? I mean, uh, at, at 2,000 US dollars when it first came on the market, at that point that was one lakh of rupees, uh, it really cost about the same as a high-end DVD player in a luxury Western car that one of you would be driving here. Of course, there was no DVD player in the Tata Nano, and no radio either in the basic model, but its innovations garnered 34 patents. And they were not merely the result of doing away with frills, which they did. No power bakes, no air conditioning, no side view mirrors even. But they reduced the use of steel by inventing an aluminum engine. They increased space by moving the wheels to the edge of the chassis. And they relied on a modular design that enabled the car to be assembled from kits all of which were absolutely groundbreaking innovations by Indian engineers sitting in India, looking at Indian needs and Indian realities, and the Indian purse. Now, the car flopped because, unfortunately, Tata's marketing people marketed it as the cheapest car in the country, in the world, for that matter. And nobody wants to be caught dead driving the cheapest car, uh, which was a major marketing boo-boo. If they had said, you know, the smartest car in India 34 global patents took the Geneva Automobile Salon by storm, all of which is true, they might actually have had a best-selling car. But owning a car is an aspirational thing, and the very audience Ratan Tata was aiming for, that is the, the person who's putting four members of his family on a two-wheeler, uh, often without helmets, and venturing into dangerous traffic, would instead have a car. Instead of telling them it's the cheapest car and just for 20,000 more than your bike you can get a car, 
they should have sold it differently. Anyway, so the marketing disaster was actually a great innovation success. And India has other innovation successes. You know, we had a mission to Mars, Mangalyaan, which became the very first Mars orbiter in the world to orbit Mars successfully on its first attempt. The US and the EU both have Mars orbiters, but they failed at several attempts before they got it to work. The Chinese and the Japanese have made several attempts, all unsuccessful. India got it done on its first attempt. Indian science, science, uh, space scientists, Indian innovators. But you know what they did? They did it for a grand total of about $70 million, 492 crore rupees, which was lower than the budget of the Hollywood space movie, Gravity. And it was about 11% of NASA's cost uh, for its own uh, last Mars orbiter program. But you can look at other examples. Sometimes American companies in India have come up with innovations. There's the GE Mac 400, which is a hard handheld electrocardiogram device that costs less than $800, okay, 50,000 rupees for the ECG machine, whereas the cheapest alternative in the market is $2,000. Now, the G Mac uh, 400 use, just uses four buttons rather than the usual dozen. It is a tiny portable printer like the ones your waiters will bring you in a fancy restaurant to take your credit card, but that'll print out your ECG. And, and it's, it's small enough to be put in a knapsack or satchel and run on batteries. And it's reduced the cost of an ECG to about 50 rupees, much less than a dollar per patient. Now that is affordable even to poor Indians. And given how many Indians die of heart disease, it's actually a life-saving innovation. Equally significant is from an Indian company, Tata Swatch, which is a 1,500 rupee water purifier, 10 times cheaper than the nearest competing water purifier and which uses a common waste product from the paddy fields, rice husks. And these rice husks are used to purify water. Given that some, some two million people in India are dying from drinking contaminated water every year, these innovations are not just groundbreaking, they're addressing real problems, corresponding to the real needs of real Indians everywhere. And, and there are so many other examples where I know we're running out of time and it's the end of your day, but, um, uh, a low-cost, fuel-efficient mini-truck. Uh, there's an expensive mini-tractor made uh, in India that sells in the U.S. Um, there's a battery-powered refrigerator that's cheapest in the world. There's a $70 electricity inverter. You couldn't get it for a tenth the price in this country. Uh, I mean, you, you couldn't get it for 10 times that price in this country. Um, there's a $9 solar lamp. Um, and, of course, there are medical innovations that are widespread. An Indian company invented a cheaper hepatitis B vaccine, which brought down the price from $15 an injection previously to less than a dollar. So can you imagine the extraordinary, trans uh, the, the fraction of the cost of hepatitis B vaccine? Similarly, insulin's price has fallen by 40% thanks to innovations by an Indian biotech firm. Uh, another biotech firm in Bangalore has come up with a diagnostic tool to test for tuberculosis and infectious diseases that costs about $125 compared to $7,500 for comparable equipment in the U.S. $125 versus $7,500. Uh, those of you who watched the Oscars a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago, I guess now, uh, must have heard the story of Arunachalam Muruganantam, who uh, scripted history. Um, uh, his, his story was told in the documentary, period, end of sentence, uh, because he's the man who actually ended the stigma associated with menstruation by inventing an inexpensive sanitary pad manufacturing machine, which makes pads out of cloth for one third the price of commercially produced sanitary pads. Uh, he was socially ostracized. His own family disowned him for getting mixed up in issues like periods. But today, his innovations are not only recognized, they have not only uh, transformed lives of people in India, they've been exported to 106 countries, Kenya, Bangladesh, the Philippines, and now they've won an Oscar. So the point I'm making is that Indian innovation is most worth celebrating when it addresses issues that matter in India. I mean, you folks understandably 
are not going to spend the same amount of effort, money, and so on, researching uh, a solution for sanitary pads or, 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 or making a, an ultra-cheap car or, for that matter, uh, even reducing the price uh, of vaccines for certain diseases in the ways in which India needs to because, for India, these are solutions that affect millions of Indians. And, and, um, and so, you know, you, you are going ahead with your driverless cars, good for you. Uh, as an Indian policymaker, I'm in absolutely no rush to import driverless cars to India because I'm conscious there are 25 million Indians who have no other profession but driving. That's 25 million people who are going to be thrown out of a job if every car went driverless. But you want to get me a driverless bicycle that will help uh, people with physical disabilities to get around? Or you can come up with some intelligent, uh, affordable electric scooters uh, so that you can reduce the amount of pollutants that are coming out there. All of those I would welcome. Uh, uh, there's apparently now a new laptop that's been invented that promotes IT literacy, coming with preloaded software and entertainment systems, invented in India for 6,000 rupees, okay? $85 for a laptop. Um, there's emergency alert systems uh, built into jewelry in case somebody comes to snatch yours. Um, and that happens a lot in India. You can send off the alarm. Um, alcohol consumption detector in bike helmets. I don't know anybody in America thought that was necessary in India. Believe me, it is. And they have invented one of those. Um, and all of these things are, are, as I say, always related to real needs. A story I'm particularly fond of telling was told to me by my friend, the very famous scientist, Dr. Arya Mashelkar. He initiated an award for Indian innovation, a name for his late mother, the Anjali Mashelkar Inclusive Innovation Award. But he said he would give the prize not just to a very clever, creative innovation, but to an innovation that actually dealt with a real problem that mattered to Indians. So the first one he gave, the first prize is won by a gentleman called Dr. Sham Vasudev, whose invention is known as Three Netra. Now, what's the background to this? We have some 50 million people in our country who are blind, most of them for preventable reasons, very many of them developing glaucoma or cataracts that are never checked and identified when they could have actually been stopped with simple treatment. Why do we still have so many cases, particularly amongst the Indian poor? Because a lot of the people affected and who turn blind in the end are daily wage laborers. And if you go and get your eyes tested for glaucoma or cataract, they put drops in your eyes that dilate your pupils and you have fuzzy vision for hours afterwards. Now, if you're a daily wage worker and you have fuzzy vision for several hours, you don't work that day. And if you don't work that day, you get no wage that day. And if you get no wage that day, your family starves. So as a responsible head of household and a daily wage worker, you forego the test in order to keep food on the table for your kids. And that's what people were doing. And as a result, preventably turning blind. So Dr. Sham Vasudev said, I'm going to find a solution to this. And he came up with a, an invention, three netra, which is a non-invasive procedure. It can test for five major eye diseases, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, cornea, and refractive indexes in a manner that does not compromise one's eyesight even for a few minutes. It's a non-madriatic test. It doesn't temporarily make your vision fuzzy. And the cost is one-sixth that of a standard glaucoma test. And it can be operated by somebody with minimal training. And there's a game changer that is increasingly being adopted around the country. And Dr. Mashelka uh, awarded that. He's come up with other prizes since this was, he invented the prize in 2011. In 2012, there was a thing called the Touch HB, which can detect anemia in a non-invasive manner. The 2016, 2016 winner was for a breast examination that can detect cancerous lesions, again, affordably and accessibly, and so on. And there's a, uh, two, the last one, the 2018 winner, was a biosensing device that can help with managing diabetes, chronic kidney disease, anemia, and malnutrition at 80% less cost than conventional methods. So the reason I'm proud of innovations like this is because they respond 
to genuine problems in India and arguably by extension in other countries in the developing world, which innovation is capable of solving. Um, I've been hearing about some new things since these awards. There's something called AI VAD, uh, which also looks like AIV aid. It's uh, an AI enabled health diagnosis system, which runs through combinations of symptoms uh, using artificial intelligence and generates health information and diagnoses. And it's got um, voice enabled interfaces and perpetual chat support so that traditional doctor visits can easily be supplemented. Uh, Narayana Health, the famous heart hospital, um, is offering uh, cardiac care at much lower cost than any competitor through a high volume, highly standardized model of care and a central buying unit for purchasing and leasing consumables. So that means that a bypass surgery, I g gather the average cost of a bypass surgery in the US is $144,000. The average cost of a bypass surgery at Narayana Health is $1,500. And these, it's now 12% of all the heart operations performed in India are performed using Narayana Health's methods, and 50% of their patients pay nothing. They're low income families, they don't have the money, they can't afford the $1,500. So the others pay to subsidize the poor, but even what they pay is much less than would cost them to come to this country for treatment. Um, and I can give you, I've collected lots of examples because I was initially told to speak for a longer time than I'm actually left with now. So I, 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 I just want to let you know where, I'm, where this is coming from, there's a lot more happening. And that's, that's what's so exciting about Indian innovation. Thinking out of the box, resolving these major problems within limited resources, staying in touch with our realities, our necessities, this is the real disruption. When I spoke about convergence and disruption and this tie setting in 2006, it was a political speech. It was about the onset of terrorism and the disruptions uh, brought about by what was increasingly seen as clashes around the world. Today, what I celebrate as disruption are the disruptions of conventional ways of thinking, of traditional methods of practice, of orthodox ways of learning. We can actually do much more of that and, um, and we can do better, if you like, than inventing zeros uh, in, the, in, the, in the years ahead. Um, because whether we're here in California or whether we're sitting in India, there are millions of people waiting to benefit from the results of such innovations. Um, our problems haven't changed in many, many decades. Uh, you folks have moved on to a different level of existence. We are still in many parts of India struggling to achieve roti, kapra, or makan, um, food, clothing, and shelter. Though in some places the slogan has changed to Bijli, Sarak, and Pani, uh, electricity, good roads, and clean drinking water. And now increasingly, Naukri, and employment, and, um, and maybe even 4G internet are becoming demanded by the voters as part of the results of good governance in our country. And the result, therefore, is the need to find new ways of meeting these perennial needs. The needs are there where millions of people who still don't have all of these things, can't take them for granted. But when I look at the situation facing our country, I actually throw my mind back. I get my determination, I, my inspiration from the 1890s, when a very respectable Indian gentleman, the great industrialist-to-be, Jamshedji Tata, was thrown out of Pike's Hotel, or was it Watson's? There's some dispute as which hotel it was. Thrown out of this hotel in Bombay, and there was a sign outside the hotel that said, Indians and dogs not allowed. Well, peak of the British Empire, what does this Indian do? He goes off and buys the land and builds a larger, better, more luxurious hotel that was open to Indians, the Taj Mahal Hotel. I don't know what you could do with the dogs, but that wasn't his problem. And, um, Today, the Taj remains one of the finest hotels in the world, whereas Pike's Hotel and Watson's, for that matter, have long since closed. Similarly, when Tata set up the first modern steel mill in India, the British had destroyed the traditional steel industry, but the modern steel mill using British specifications, when Tata tried to set up, he had to go through 25 years of obstacles, hoops, restrictions, 
by the British officials, when finally overcame all of them and got the final permission, um, a senior imperial official, the then chairman of the railway board, sneered that I will personally eat every ounce of steel that an Indian is capable of producing. My only regret was that he didn't live long enough to see the descendants of Jamshedji Tata acquire the remnants of British steel when Tata bought Chorus. Might have given him a bad case of indigestion. But the point of harking back to the turn of the previous century is to say that it was already then time to set aside the old stereotypes of who can and cannot excel at what in our globalizing world. We need entrepreneurs who can lead. We need people who can innovate. We need people who can inspire. We need people who can reach out beyond the limits that their forerunners have taken for granted and create systems that can hold explosive potential for our common good. Those people are available in India just as much as in Silicon Valley. After all, God gave us 17% of the world's brains since we have 17% of the world's population. But oddly enough, we only produce 2.7% of the world's innovations, uh, just judging by research and patterns. That can change. We, as policymakers, have a duty to create the conditions that will make that change possible, ensure that those Indians capable of innovating are given a free hand to do it. I've been a long advocate of a policy that just came through in which uh, the government has promised tax breaks for angel investors. Um, they used to follow a rather foolish policy of saying that um, innovators running startups will get to have to pay no taxes for the first three years, overlooking the basic fact that 99% of all startups don't make profits in their first three years. So I said, far more useful, I argued in the in my budget speech in Parliament and responding to the finance minister three years in a row. I said, give the angel investors an investment to invest, an incentive to invest by not taxing them, and you'll see a real boom in this. And finally this year, that has been adopted. So those of you who have money to bring to India, <laughs> bring it, you won't have to pay tax, and the Congress party, which is shortly coming to power, has promised to maintain that concession. <laughs> So uh, let me tell you that uh, we will encourage you to come uh, with your funds, encourage innovation in India. And uh, for all the reasons I've, I've given you, all the examples I've told you, you know that your uh, nurturing, your funding, your seeding will fall on fertile soil. Now, it would be odd for an Indian politician to end the speech without quoting Mahatma Gandhi. So let me do that before wrapping up for the day. Uh, Gandhiji said that it is the quality of our work which will please God and not the quantity. That's something we in India have tended to forget a bit, uh, but it's, it's happening now. Quality is more and more in the forefront. He also said more famously, be the change you wish to see in the world. And um, since quality in India will not come without change, and since... Um, since um, both his exhortations would apply to all of us here thinking about Indian innovation. We need to change ourselves in India, we need to change our patterns of thinking, and we have to work with you to create better networks, um, and to do so by producing work and results of the highest quality. I think these thoughts of Mahatma Gandhi can and will continue to illuminate India's continued quest for innovation that meets the real needs of real Indians in the century that lies ahead. Thanks very much and have a great conference. What an amazing talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Do you guys have any questions for Shashi? He's uh, very gracious, he said he'll spend a few more minutes answering any questions you may have for him. Any questions from the audience? Could you come closer, then I'll repeat your question on the mic, if you haven't got a mic there. There isn't a handheld mic for the audience, no. Yes, sir. Oh, there is a handheld mic. Mr. Tharun, I have great ad admiration for you. you Thank you, sir. Some good speeches. But I have a que question. If a gentleman is elected legitimately by the people right. for five years, 
Don't you think it is an onus on you to make sure that person is totally supported? Democracies don't work that way, do they? In a democracy, in a democracy, you should retain the right to be able to oppose those policies you disagree with and indeed to support those policies you agree with. For example, we had come up with a bankruptcy law which couldn't be passed in our tenure. When Mr. Modi brought it, we supported it. It passed with our support. We had tried to bring in Aadhaar. Mr. Modi had opposed it as late as the 2014 election. He said he would demolish it when he came. He decided to adopt it. We supported him. GST, for 10 years we had proposed a GST. It had been blocked by the opposition of the BJP and particularly by the then Chief Minister of Gujarat. When he decided to bring it in, we tried to improve it by bringing it closer to our original model of a GST, but in the end we said we won't stand in the way of what's good for the country and we supported it. That kind of constructive support for specific policies, which we are in agreement with, yes, but when there are statements and policies we profoundly disagree with, it's our duty as a democratic opposition to oppose and to give the nation a clear picture of what the alternative would be. One last question, sir. If, if in this election he's once again voted into power, would you then support him? Like again, it would depend on policies. I mean, I, my agreements and disagreements with Mr. Modi have been extensively chronicled, and I have a rather fat book out there called The Paradoxical Prime Minister, where I talk about the things he said that I agree with and the things he's done that I disagree with. So you can, you can see that, you know, if you want to be objective and fair in a democracy, your opposition must be constructive. If you oppose everything for the sake of opposing, then clearly the public will not take you seriously. But if you support things that need to be supported, and I gave you three examples, or four examples, and then you oppose the things where you disagree, your opposition has more value because people realize you're not just opposing blindly, you're opposing on the basis of principles and legitimate policy disagreements. That's my attitude to opposition. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Tharoor, uh, one question. Um, you mentioned we have about 10,000 startups in India. Um, Those are government figures, huh? <laughs> 4,200 so, in 2016. So 11,000 they project for 2020. So I think we have probably more startups than just the Silicon Valley alone. Oh, I'm sure you're right. So what are we doing as a policymaker in India to increase that volume? Because we have that potential, and as you suggested, the examples of startup companies in India could be huge, humongous, you know, the capabilities we have. So as policymakers, what are the changes that you are suggesting? Right. So, I mean, the, the short answer is you started a lot earlier. I mean, you guys go back to the 60s in many ways uh, when it comes to coming up with startups and innovations. We, we were certainly well behind the curve. Our liberalization only came in 1991, until which it was not a hospitable environment for businesses to start. Uh, but now we're playing catch up pretty effectively. And as I said, that accelerating pace of change, if you've really gone from 4,200 in 2016 to 10,000 in 2019, that's pretty serious change. And I would say that we are capable of maintaining that pace of change because there's been a change in the mindset of Indians. You know, our generation, I can't really see you in this light, so maybe you're younger than me, but many people in my generation were devotees of the Sarkari Nokri idea, right? What you wanted was a government job with a secure salary, a guaranteed pension, and you couldn't be fired. That was what people saw as the most desirable thing in the marriage market. A prospective bridegroom with commanded the highest price, quote unquote, was somebody who had a government job. Now, that mentality is changing. And people are saying, we can start our own businesses and do far better than the government bureaucrats we might otherwise have turned out to be. And so very many people are now transforming themselves into entrepreneurs at various levels. A state like Kerala, which was considered notoriously leftist in its, in, in its inclinations, the Congress, the previous Congress government in Kerala, brought about a scheme that actually encourages college students to start innovations and startups for university credit. And we have, in, my, in the Technopark in, in Trivandrum, we have an I am an entrepreneur scheme where you can literally come and pitch an idea, and we halfway make sense, we'll give you an office and a desk and, and some basic support and some seed capital, and a certain amount of time to try and make your idea a reality. These are things that didn't happen in India five years ago, 10 years ago. These are transformations that 
actually reflect new ways of thinking for India. They're not so new for you guys. You've been doing it for a long time in this part of the world. We haven't. And when that kind of change starts coming, it accelerates. And I'm very confident you'll find India absolutely booming and thriving. Look, in 1990, I remember giving an interview when I published my novel, The Great Indian Novel. And I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that Indians seem to thrive everywhere in the world except in India. Why is that? And of course, it got me a lot of flack at the time. But the truth is that we didn't have an ecosystem that encouraged people to, to, to thrive in quite that way. Today, in the last, since 1991, and in an accelerating way, getting better every year, we do have that ecosystem, and it's getting more and more deeper and wider. So I'm very optimistic. It needs encouragement. It needs technology. It needs uh, encouragement and the sense of money as well, uh, whatever you guys can come in and invest in India. But it'll be falling in fertile ground. We still um, you know, cost less than equivalent people here. And, and our products are just as good. So um, give us a try. Huh. Uh, you quoted several Indian innovations and the sort of definitely commendable, like I mean, several others, and as well as the mission to Mars, like which is definitely commendable. Uh, but at the same time, like we are importing a bullet train right now. Like, I mean, what is your opinion of an Indian innovation that can do a cheaper, better bullet train, or may maybe a missile? Sorry, bus? a cheaper, better bullet train itself. Bullet like, train. essentially. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of an innovation, like that's kind of somewhere in between, and that's not lacking. The, that's lacking the encouragement so far. See, I, I honestly think that's a misplaced priority. I want first our trains to run on time. I want our trains to run at a decent average speed of, say, 95 or 100 kilometers an hour, right around, they're running at an average speed of below 35 kilometers an hour, which is amongst the slowest in the world. I want track maintenance to be reliable enough and, and, and automated enough so we have minimized the number of accidents. We have the world's worst record in railway accidents in the world. A bullet train, which by definition is 300 kilometers an hour and up, is an extravagance and a luxury in a country where we haven't got the basics right yet. So my priority, if I were making that policy, would be first eliminate railway accidents, have a 100% um, uh, track maintenance policy, create more automatic signaling. In many parts of India, we still don't have automatic signaling. So trains are scheduled by human beings and they're constantly running late. Create, as a result, a higher average speed of train, improve both engines and track. And when you've got that going, when you've reached the situation where literally, I'll give you that yardstick, if the average speed of an Indian passenger train is 95 kilometers an hour throughout the country, then let's start talking about bullet trains. We're nowhere near there yet. That's all right, I I'll talk offline. Thank you, uh, I'm a big fan of your writings as well as your oration, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is why always Nehru family why not you or any other senior leader as the face of Congress? Sorry, sir, I missed that. Thanks for the applause, but what was it? Could you repeat uh, why that? Why always was Nehru family and not you or any other senior leader as face of Congress? Why oh. always Nehru family? <laughs> well, I'm touched by your, your confidence, but that's very simple in the parliamentary system. The party leaders are the people in the fray, and there's no question in our party as to who the leader is. And any sort of free and fair election within the Congress party, amongst Congress party workers, for who should lead the party, you can be absolutely sure it would be a Nehru Gandhi. And specifically right now, Rahul Gandhi would handsomely win against any Congress leader you could care to name. So we have to, if you join a party, it also has to do with the values, principles, policies of that party. And frankly, um, I happen to agree with most of the policies and principles of the party. The leadership comes with the, the party whose policies you're supporting. And I'm very happy to work with Rahul Gandhi as a leader. I found him very effective and indeed getting more and more effective uh, in the course of the last couple of years as the nation has been seeing. So um, to me, that's really a marginal question. In any case, don't forget that the last two Congress prime ministers were not members of the Nehru Gandhi family. Uh. Thank you for the most eloquent uh, keynote. You're definitely my most favorite speaker in the world. Um, Thank you, yeah. that's very kind. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my question was more about, you know, you, you talk a lot about colonization of the, the British Empire. 
That was uh, back then, but there's another kind of colonization coming up, the data colonization, and India definitely is the third world uh, country. So uh, if you see that coming, how can you prevent that colonization so we don't go back to the... Uh, you know, well, you know, we already fought back against Facebook's free basics idea, where they wanted essentially to colonize the internet by saying they would offer a special deal where essentially for next to nothing, they would get five or six... Uh, uh, specific apps that Facebook would provide for free, and there would be basic internet. They, it was, tr they tried to sell it to India as a way of um, giving inexpensive or actually basically free access uh, to the internet for 500 million people, uh, except that, of course, it'd all be controlled by Facebook. And when India woke up to the fact that this was what was happening. There was a major resistance, civil society organizations, NGOs, as well as a few politicians my, like myself, leapt into uh, opposing this very strongly. And in the end, the Telecom Regulatory Authority hit back and, and banned this approach in India. So I think you'll find that one good thing about India is there is awareness. Uh, data colonization is something people are very conscious of. There is um, a slight challenge between, on the one hand, resisting Western multinational companies coming and taking command of all our data, and on the other hand, risking an Indian monopoly company rising and also taking command of all our data. So some people say, well, it makes no difference to me whether I'm a slave of Google or a slave of Reliance Geo. I don't want to be a slave. Find me another way. And so policymakers are grappling with how we can do this. Um, so far, I would say the current government seems to have essentially through particularly its recent e-commerce rules decided to protect Indian e-commerce enterprises um, against Western invasions. And this is going to cause us certain trade-related tensions with the United States because the U.S. is going to see this as a restrictive trade practice. But data sovereignty is what's considered the issue at stake. I'm not going to suggest that any of these issues can be glibly answered in a two-sentence response. There are people like me who are aware of what's at stake, but before I come up with a, a considered policy approach, whether in government or in the opposition, it would require a lot more consultation with stakeholders than anyone has done so far in India, not even the present government. Thank you for your time here today. Uh, Today we have the technology uh, for creating the transparency in the lot of government agencies. Uh, those transparency can be used to fight the corruption. So what's your thought on using the technologies and the innovation to cut down the corruption in India? If there were a India? technological solution to corruption, I'm all for it. I'd like to know more how it works. Because one of the reasons people are corrupt, unfortunately, is that for everybody who's willing to take a corrupt inducement, there's somebody who wants to pay for a shortcut or a favor out of turn. And that's really why corruption exists. There's a giver and a taker all along. It's not that the system alone demands it. It's that people feel that if they can save two hours in a queue uh, or, or much more, uh, they're willing to pay for it. And that culture is rather deeply spread into society. If there's a technological way we can solve that, tell me about it. My email is office at tharoor.in. Write to me. I'll be happy to look into this and, and try and get back to you whether these ideas we can take further forward in the next parliament. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. And uh, my question is a bit controversial. Uh, what do you say about the rise of the religious right in both America and India and please answer freely, I come from Mamata Banerjee State. You come from? Mamata Banerjee State. I see. <laughs> well, look, I mean, this is actually an increasingly worldwide phenomenon. In many ways, it's uh, the underreported part of the backlash against globalization. We're all familiar with the economic backlash against globalization, but we've not fully appreciated the cultural backlash against globalization, where there's been a perception that the globe, the world economy, and world polities are actually being run by a deracinated cosmopolitan elite 
the Davos man, comfortable in business class lounges anywhere in the world, who is cut away from the authentic experience of the masses. Another way of looking at it is the, the somewheres versus the anywheres, that people who are comfortable anywhere in the world are running the world, and the people who are anchored somewhere are not. So in response to this, you have the rise of various forms of authenticity as the basis for identity and of nationalism. And this authenticity is often manifested in a reassertion of religious identity. Whether it's Erdogan's version of Islam in Turkey, whether it's Modi's Hindutva in India, whether it's um, uh, the, the right-wing Christians in this country or in Western Europe, they're all representing, as they see it, a return to authentic traditional roots of their identities, identities they see as beleaguered in Europe by immigration, in America to some degree by immigration, and in India by people of other faiths. And so the whole idea is that we must reassert who we really are uh, in, our, in, our, in our search for identity. If you see religious uh, revivalism and nationalism in that context, you're able to grapple with it more directly. In a country like India, it is obviously a direct challenge to the diversity and pluralism that people like me have long celebrated as our greatest strength. I've been writing books for over three decades, praising India's pluralism. For me, it was an article of pride when, as a UN official, I was running around the Gulf countries in the Arab world in 2004, and these ministers and officials I was meeting, their jaws were dropping open in astonishment that my country had just had an election won by a woman political leader who was born in Italy and have a Catholic background, who made way for a Sikh to be sworn in by a Muslim president in a country 80% Hindu. And for them, the admiration was unabashed, and I was able to say, we're not trying to impress you folks. This is simply the way we are. This is India, or as the Indian expression goes, we are like this only. But now that we are like this only is being challenged by people with a much more narrow idea of Indian nationalism, equating it with a very narrow interpretation of Hinduism. And that has to be challenged and contested, and that's one of the reasons why I gather so many bucks protested my coming here, is because I have been strongly identified with a challenge to this interpretation, not only of Indian nationalism, which I'm very proud of and which has nothing to do with any one faith, but even of Hinduism itself, which I'm equally proud of, but which I follow passionately the Vivekanand interpretation, that says that uh, Hinduism is not just about tolerance, it's about acceptance. Acceptance of difference, acceptance of other ways of worship, all is equally valid. Ekam sat vipra bahodavadanti. There is only one truth, but the sages call it by different names. And what Vivekananda taught us is that ultimately, just as various rivers can flow crooked or straight in different directions to the same sea, so also all different religions are ultimately worshipping in a way that reaches the same divine substance. And that divinity we are all reaching out for, there is no reason for one to feel superior to the next. Acceptance is the name of the game. And that is a very good prescription, not just for Hinduism, but frankly for a multi-religious society like India. And anything that challenges that principle, that reduces the soaring majesty of Hindu philosophy to something much more like the team identity of the British football hooligan, which is what some people in the Hindutva movement have been trying to do, must be resisted, and that's why I'm resisting it. Sir, one more, one question. Sir, sir one, more, one more truth about this country, is, and, and also one more truth about Hinduism is this meritocracy, uh, rather than just being, you know, dynasty and, and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, there is no entitlement that, that people hold in most meritocracies. Whereas, uh, you know, through some policies which are, which are being propagated by, uh, you know, specifically the party that you come from and in, you know, by, by prospect for the country if your, if your uh, party comes to power, is this 72,000 rupees that uh, will be given to every person who's uh, earning less than a certain amount of money. So this entitlement, uh, do you think is it, is it good for the country uh, or good for such a large set of population to just get money for uh, and not be entitled to or not at least work for it? Is well, that good for the country, you think? One, one could have made a, a, an argument for simply expanding the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme 
to give people employment for the money, but the idea was still that the money must reach all these people. And the reason is very simple. You want to transform your country and your economy, you want to grow. But you've got this large percentage of your population, some estimate as high as 22 to 25 percent, who are living below the poverty line and barely able to make ends meet. Can't afford two square meals a day, a roof over their heads, the prospect of a decent life, education, and so on. How on earth can you expect them to be meaningfully productive members of your society? So the challenge for us is, how do you give these people an opportunity that is denied to them by their financial circumstances? to participate like everybody else. I mean, I have argued in Parliament some years ago that the magic of the market cannot appeal to those who cannot afford to enter the marketplace. So you're just giving them the means, a basic income, to become consumers, to participate in the market, and then through their own participation to be able to help grow the economy themselves. You're turning them from objects of pity into actual productive members of your economy and your society. For that, you need to give them a basic guaranteed income. I'm personally uh, equally comfortable with the idea of just expanding the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme to reach the same 20 crore um, beneficiaries that this scheme would reach, 5 million households. But either way, whether you give it or you give it in exchange for work, giving it gives them an opportunity to just get beyond subsistence realities. It was actually something that I'd suggest that we should give the money to the eldest women in the household because the track record of women in actually spending the money for real essentials rather than blowing it up at the local toddy, toddy shop is unarguable. There's a lot of studies that will confirm that. And once we do that, we are in a situation where, quite honestly, we should have a society where you don't have 20% excluded from the opportunities for meaningful growth. That's the reason we're doing it. Thank you all very much. I've already got the signal. We have to wrap up. Great pleasure talking to you all. Jai Hind.